My name is Jessica Mindlin, and I work for the Victim Rights Law Center, which is a nonprofit legal services organization that's based in Boston, but we also have an office in Portland, Oregon. And I both direct our Portland, Oregon office, and then I'm also direct our National Technical Assistance Efforts, or TA, we often abbreviate it. And really what that means is that I'm a consultant, resource, mentor, go-to person for lawyers and advocates and other victim service providers around the country who are serving sexual assault survivors or who are serving survivors of gender-based violence specific to privacy issues or to civil legal issues. We take a very holistic approach to what sexual assault survivors need and look at them really as a whole person to help identify what has been impacted by the sexual assault and how can we as lawyers use legal remedies and use the law to help meet survivors' needs. And it's typically, most of our survivor clients don't have needs just in one area, but as you might expect, um, the sexual assault will impact perhaps their safety, their privacy, if they're working, their employment situation, if they're attending school, their educational trajectory. And when they come to us for services, we will provide legal representation in all of those areas. And then we help other lawyers, advocates, saying sexual assault nurse examiners and other victim service providers do the same. When I'm talking about survivor privacy, I really think of it as an umbrella term and privacy overall, meaning the obligation to keep certain information private that survivors share with us or that we learn about the survivor in the course of our work with them. And then underneath that umbrella, that privacy umbrella, is confidentiality and privilege. And by confidentiality, really what I mean are um, it may be a legal obligation, so a statute sets out a survivor's confidentiality rights, or it could be an ethical or licensing obligation on the part of the provider. So for example, healthcare providers, lawyers, advocates in some states all have a duty of confidentiality to keep information and hold it in private unless they have permission from the survivor to share it or to release it. And then another category is even narrower and that's privilege. And privilege is usually established by a statute and it's different from one jurisdiction to another. So a state may have its own privilege statute. A tribe may have its own privilege statute. The US territory may have its own. And those are really rules of evidence that prohibit or address what can be um, ordered to be released in the context of a, a legal he proceeding or a court hearing. And people often use those terms interchangeably or conflate them as if they were all one. but. Being a lawyer, those terms have very specific meanings for me. There are many different federal laws that impact survivors' privacy rights. I think the ones that are most relevant or come up most often in the victim service provider community are um, the confidentiality provisions in three federal laws, and those are the what we often abbreviate as FIPSA, which is the Family Violence Prevention Services Act. Now you know why we abbreviate it. Um, VOCA, which stands for the Victims of Crime Act, and VAWA, which is the Violence Against Women Act. And all three of those federal laws have really almost identical confidentiality provisions. And in essence, what those laws, those federal laws say is that anyone that receives funding under those grant programs may not release a survivor's personally identifying information unless one of three criteria is met. Either they have the survivor's written and informed consent, a statutory mandate, such as mandatory reporting laws, maybe about child abuse or elder abuse, or a court mandate and a court order. Although I always like to put an asterisk by court order because Judges um, are human too and sometimes make mistakes and just because a court order is issued in a case doesn't mean that we should turn over all of a survivor's private information. You need to assess that court order and say, was it properly issued? Um, should it be challenged? Should it be contested? In addition to the federal laws that address survivor's privacy rights and 
provider's confidentiality obligations. There are also state-specific laws, which are important to mention. And every law, every jurisdiction will have its own set of laws. Um, and typically, in most jurisdiction, advocates are covered by those, by those confidentiality obligations. And again, those laws set out the circumstances, which are typically quite narrow, under which an advocate either may or must provide a survivor's personally identifying or other private information without survivor consent. And at the heart of all of those laws is a recognition that privacy is absolutely critical to um, survivors' ability to and willingness to access resources for agencies and to build community trust, to get individual survivors to trust them. I mean, who would come and seek services from a provider that you felt wouldn't keep your information in confidence? Um, and that also it builds not just trust with the individual survivor, but of all of the, their constellation who's impacted by an assault. And then finally, um, it's really critical to provider, excuse me, to survivor safety, which is we know that there are very real consequences emotionally and in terms of just a very a survivor's very existence to their life when privacy is breached. When it comes to addressing privacy and confidentiality issues in a SART, I think it's often both um, a strength for SARTs that they are multidisciplinary so that they bring together law enforcement and the advocate community and a prosecutor and maybe a health care provider or school representatives. I mean, every SART is different. And every profession, and depending upon funding, sets of professionals are governed by very different privacy and confidentiality obligations. And that is then reflected in terms of the privacy and confidentiality issues that SARTs have to address and often will struggle with. And I think one of the most critical starting places is for SARTs to have conversations that are, okay, first of all, what are the differing missions of all of the various professions and disciplines that are represented on the SART? Because, for example, law enforcement or the prosecutor, their primary obligation and goal is going to be community safety. For a healthcare provider, it's going to be to the patient. To the advocate, it will be always be at the center is have it providing survivor-centered services. So some clashes or differing perspectives are inevitable because these individuals have different perspectives, different obligations, and having that conversation at the very outset and repeatedly, because there's turnover, people forget, et cetera, is so critical to SARTs being able to work together. I want to give you an example of why it can be so important for SARTs to have that confidentiality discussion and to know more about one another. I did some consulting with a SART that had been working together for two years and had never had this conversation. And through my conversations with them individually and then collectively, it became clear that, number one, this was an issue that was causing tremendous resentment. It was festering, and it had been festering for almost 24 months at that point. And I had the good fortune to be able to talk to people in advance and to ask these questions and to say, what are your confidentiality policies in your agency? Do you have any promises or assurances of privacy that you give survivors? Where does that come from? And then was able to bring them back together where they shared what their missions were, what informed their missions. So is it from the board of directors, for example, for a nonprofit community-based agency? Is it by statute, the way it might be for law enforcement, et cetera? And then they shared that information with one another. And it was the first time after meeting for two years on a regular basis, for example, that parole and probation and actually some of the law enforcement representatives learned that the advocates in this jurisdiction were not mandatory reporters of child abuse and were not mandatory reporters of elder abuse. And it was this aha moment for them. And they said, we have been so angry at you for two years because you were never doing the reporting that you should have been which is what they thought. And the advocates were able to say, 
We're not mandated to report, and in fact, we're not allowed to report this without survivor consent. And it really was like this, you know, fresh air that came through the room that let them sort of acknowledge the resentment, the frustration, the hostility that had been all beneath the surface. And I always hold on to that as an example of why it's so important not only to have these conversations at the beginning, but to revisit them, to talk about what are your policies, where do they come from, why do you have them, so that they're not operating from this place of miscommunication and confusion. When it comes to addressing privacy and confidentiality issues in a SART, I think it's often both um, a strength for SARTs that they are multidisciplinary so that they bring together law enforcement and the advocate community and a prosecutor and maybe a health care provider or school representatives. I mean, every SART is different. And every profession, and depending upon funding, sets of professionals are governed by very different privacy and confidentiality obligations. And that is then reflected in terms of the privacy and confidentiality issues that SARTs have to address and often will struggle with. And I think one of the most critical starting places is for SARTs to have conversations that are, okay, first of all, what are the differing missions of all of the various professions and disciplines that are represented on the SART? Because, for example, law enforcement or the prosecutor, their primary obligation and goal is going to be community safety. For a healthcare provider, it's going to be to the patient. To the advocate, it will be always be at the center is have it providing survivor-centered services. So some clashes or differing perspectives are inevitable because these individuals have different perspectives, different obligations, and having that conversation at the very outset and repeatedly, because there's turnover, people forget, et cetera, is so critical to SARTs being able to work together. I think also not taking it personally when information isn't being shared. I've certainly over the years heard um, folks who say, look, the attitude on my SART is, well, if advocates aren't going to be sharing information about individual survivors, why are they here? Why are they at the table? And I'm always encouraging the notion that it doesn't always have to be a two-way exchange, that there's information that can come out of the SART back into the community that helps those who are working with survivors on the front lines. Um, also, oftentimes looking at, well, what's your mission? And why are you, you taking a particular approach? Is that with whatever it is that you, um, are, are the goals that you've identified that you want to achieve? For example, oftentimes SARTs will say, well, we've got to start with doing case review. But if you were to drill down a bit and look and say, well, why are you doing case review? Or why are you doing it now? The answer sometimes is, well, that was like the place to start. So I would ask them to take a step back and say, what are you trying to accomplish? And what are the different avenues for trying to accomplish that? And start by building trust, recognizing that everyone who comes to the table has something important to bring, and that you aren't always going to be advancing your goals by sharing survivors' personal information. In fact, by c trying to force that hand and make that happen, it may have the absolute opposite reaction, that you may not get the participation that you want. You may get survivors who stop coming forward because they don't want their information disclosed in this context, whereas instead what could happen is you're getting informed consent. That always should be happening before. In fact, it's legally required for most of those folks who are participating on this art. Um, it's always a huge concern and a red flag to me when I hear people say, well, everybody has signed a confidentiality agreement. Um, there was an example in my own community where everyone had signed a confidentiality agreement and was moving forward with discussions as if everybody was going to keep that information in confidence. The problem was that there was no basis for that in the law. And when it got challenged, all of a sudden, everybody went, oh my goodness, we never would have shared this information if we thought it was going to come out in court. And at that point, it was too late. And it was in a very high lethality case. Um, I think another important thing, and this is easier said than done, um, but I think all of us need to check our egos at the door. That sometimes how we define success um, 
is really not what success looks like when we're looking to address sexual assault in our communities. That it's not about how many prosecutions we have or how many convictions we get. It really is, are we providing survivor-centered services in our community in a way that makes it safe for survivors to come forward, to have their needs identified, and for us as a community to address those needs. That is what makes our community safer. One of the things that I think is always important from a multi-jurisdictional perspective, and what I mean by that is you may have a survivor who was raped or sexually assaulted in one state or um, in one tribal nation and who is now living in a different state, for example, or a different territory. And so what you're dealing with in that situation are two different sets of laws that may in fact provide for very different levels of confidentiality for that survivor. So for those who work with survivors on the ground, they need resources, they need someone that they can turn to, folks who can help them say, okay, this is what the survivor's rights look like, and here's how you, kind of, you analyze this situation. Because ideally, we want survivors to have all of that information really before they ever seek services. I think it is tragic, and it sometimes has tragic outcomes for survivors, when they don't know what their privacy rights are and someone just provides referrals and only afterwards is their privacy really betrayed. And I don't know how often survivors are like, I never would have done X if I had known Y. It always really worries me, for example, when some very well-intended like social workers or counselors, and I don't mean to pick on them because it happens across many different professions, will say, particularly to youth survivors, well, why don't you keep a diary? You know, you can write in your journal or keep two of them without ever saying to the survivor, but you should know that if there's anything in there relevant to the assault and there is a criminal prosecution going forward, that diary could get subpoenaed and it could end up in court. So where you thought you were safe sharing your most innermost feelings and maybe even a history of prior victimization, all that is going to be provided to the defense. All that is going to be provided to the judge, to the prosecutor. That is such a betrayal to someone who has already experienced such a terrible betrayal in their life. And I think the focus of our work always should be advancing survivor agency, advancing survivors' control over who knows what about what happened to them, about the impact of that experience. And the key to that is letting survivors make informed decisions, and that means making sure that we all have the information to provide to them in advance. I think one of the challenges that SARTs continually confront as, is both the differing professions, the multidisciplinary aspect of who sits on that SART, and the different perspectives and confidentiality obligations and missions, in a sense, that each one of those different providers brings to the table. That's its strength, it's also a huge challenge because that means that not only does anybody come from a different perspective, you know, we all live a little bit in our own lanes, um, but that also what they are trying to achieve may at certain junctures be at odds with one another. So for example, you may have a survivor who initially says, I'll sign releases for everything, you know, that they recognize that it's not their fault, they didn't do anything wrong, um, and so quite readily will give permission to share all kinds of information. But down the road, once they maybe have had more experience in the system, begin to realize that it's not necessarily survivor-centered. They begin to maybe get more information about what happens to their, the records, for example, that they may have disclosed. And there is this retreat, understandably. And it's why in my organization, we don't use releases of information, for example, that are good for a year or good for two years, even though our representation lasts that long, because we realize that privacy is an ongoing conversation. And that when we get short-term releases, it requires us to engage the survivor, to contact them again and say, are you still okay with me doing this? Do I still have your permission to contact this individual or this agency and either ask for those records or to share these records? And it's one of the, I think, wonderful things about having short-term releases is that it forces you 
to have those conversations in an ongoing way because everyone's circumstances change and that's no less true for survivors than it is for anyone else. And so always checking in and getting survivor permission is absolutely key. How SARTS defines success is often a, an overlooked step in that conversation that they want to be having on a regular basis. And success from my perspective, if I were to wave my magic wand, would look like how are we advancing survivor agency, survivor safety, how are we creating an environment not only where we are encouraging and supporting survivors who take that really brave step of coming forward, but also acting on that information in a respectful, survivor-informed way that makes it safe, not only for that individual survivor, but for our community as a whole. And it's not necessarily about how are we convincing more and more survivors to have forensic exams or to go forward with a prosecution, but rather how are we building trust in our communities? And it's not just about prosecutions and convictions. That's one small measure, but the reality is that most sexual assault survivors don't report to law enforcement. And that even when there are reports, most of those cases don't go forward. And I don't know if there's recent data on that, but the most current data that I'm aware of says that of all of the sexual assaults that occur, and you break it down from those that occur to those that get reported to law enforcement, those that get investigated, those get that forwarded for prosecution, get prosecuted, result in a conviction, 2.3% of all offenders end up incarcerated. So we have to be thinking much more expansively when we're looking at what do survivors need and how do we meet those needs. And to me, that is the heart of success. But I think it's a conversation that every SART needs to be asking. And not just once, because as they be grow and as they strengthen and as communities change and the voices of different survivors are heard, then what success looks like will also change. So for SARTs to build a strong sense of cohesion and trust within that SART community, it takes a number of things. Um, one is to check your ego at the door, and um, which is you know hard for some folks, not for others as much. But um, again, to look at how you're defining success. Also, there is often turnover um, within the SART community, so it takes a lot of patience. It means being willing to cover ground and have conversations again that you may have had already. Um, it means recognizing that we all come from different perspectives and that everyone's work matters and that everyone really has a different sort of slice of the pie. I often describe SARTs, think of them as a bicycle wheel and you know between each set of spokes um, is a different provider and in the center of that is the survivor. It takes everyone to meet the survivor's needs and not every survivor has the same needs all of the time. Um, I think in terms of working together, it's also not taking it personally. That when someone is unwilling to share a survivor's personal information, it's not that they don't trust their colleagues on the SART, but rather maybe the survivor has requested certain information not be shared, that maybe they're funding the federal laws, such as the Violence Against Women Act, the Family Violence Prevention Services Act, or the Victims of Crime Act, all of which have confidentiality provisions, prohibit them. They may not, under federal law, share that information without the survivor's consent. And that not all survivors are in the same position. I mean, one of the things that we do know is that perpetrators target survivors who are vulnerable, who they perceive as being vulnerable, who as lacking in credibility or will be perceived as lacking in credibility. And that vulnerability may be situational. It may be somebody who either intentionally or unintentionally um, is intoxicated. You know, somebody where there was a drug facilitated sexual assault. And it may be somebody who's vulnerable in a more enduring way. Language barriers, immigration status, individuals with cognitive disabilities. We know that Native women, for example, in this country are targeted at extraordinary rates in terms of sexual violence and victimization, primarily by non-Native perpetrators. Um, youth, 
you know, 44% of all sexual assault survivors are under the age of 18, 80% are under the age of 30. So there are many reasons that victims and survivors are viewed as being very vulnerable. And um, that vulnerability is going to, for very compelling reasons, lead to different experiences, different ability and willingness to trust a system. And not all survivors um, have this, are in the same circumstances, and we need to respect and honor that. So the work of ASART is to address sexual assault and our response to those sexual assaults in our communities. And at the heart of that are survivors' experiences. And the day that we ever lose sight of that is the day that we should close up shop and go home. We have learned so much from survivors in this movement, survivors who have been extraordinarily brave and courageous and who have been willing to risk their own lives, literally, to help other survivors and to put an end to the sexual victimization that's happening in their communities. Survivors have taught us really virtually everything that we know about safety planning, about why we do medical forensic exams, about how to conduct interviews in an effective way, about how to help other survivors. I mean, without them, there wouldn't be this movement. And I think the minute we take our eyes off of that, we are doing a terrible injustice, not just to those survivors, but to all of us. Because we need their experiences to help us do better in our work. Well, I think survivors' voices need to be incorporated in the work of ASART, I mean, at every level. Um, so, first of all, it always means having survivors at the table. I mean, this is a really a movement, I think, built by and led by survivors. Um, so, th I guess I want to make sure that we're not getting into an us and a them, as if somehow assuming that those who are doing the work with the sexual assault survivor community are not themselves survivors. I mean, that's a dichotomy that I think is false. Um, but also ensuring that the work that takes place in the SART is informed by the experiences of survivors in the community. And we can gather those experiences and then reflect them back in lots of different ways. So for example, if you're looking at changes in policy or in practice, um, ask survivors. What would have made a difference? What helped? What didn't help? What was harmful? What do you wish each one of these different providers at the table had known? Tell us about your experience. So for example, in Oregon, the Sexual Assault Task Force has done interviews with survivors all across the state. And those specific interviews were focused on the survivors' experiences with law enforcement. And it made sure that many different perspectives were represented. And I use those videos in training all the time, partly because I think when we're doing trainings, we need to commit to having survivors' voices at the table and survivors' voices being heard, but also it just allows us to be better at our work. Let's learn from both our past mistakes and also our past strengths. And I would hope that everyone on the SART comes with that um, open mind and that commitment and that desire to be better. That's why we're there. That's why we're doing the work that we're doing. I mean, I always say that I hope to be obsolete someday. I would love it if there were no need for the work that I do working with sexual assault survivors. We have learned so much from survivors in this movement. I mean, safety planning is one example. Um, and in particular, I think more recently, there is an increasing awareness, which I know is a drum that I'm always beating, um, to recognize that safety planning with survivors of intimate partner violence or domestic violence is very different from safety planning with survivors of non-intimate partner sexual assault. So when someone has been sexually assaulted by a friend, an acquaintance, a coworker, um, a fellow student, somebody else in their educational or employment context, by a stranger, et cetera. So that's just one example. Another example of what survivors have taught us is the value of medical forensic examinations, obviously in partnership with the 
um, healthcare and nurse community, but that there is evidence on survivors' bodies and not just how to collect it, but the importance of explaining that whole process and what's being done and how it will be used and also the importance of giving survivors the option first to have that evidence collected and then whether or not to have it released to law enforcement for purposes of a prosecution. There used to be this assumption you're having it collected, you want the prosecution to go forward and we've really recognized that survivors need time I mean, so often when that examination is taking place, um, they're still in a place of crisis and shock and are not in a place to make informed decisions. So we now have federal laws that say you may have that forensic exam, the evidence collected to preserve it, and you don't have to decide right away whether or not you want to go forward with, a, with um, the investigation and prosecution. Survivors have taught us the long and short-term impacts of sexual assault, recognizing that it's not just a single incident or a set of incidents that happen and you know, they're self-contained, but rather they impact the whole breadth of a survivor's life. You know, for example, their housing, whether they can be in school, their relationships with family members, with partners, with friends, the hypervigilance that occurs, um, what trauma does in the long term as well as the short term post assault. You know, there's a really interesting study that looked I looked at survivors starting between the ages of six and sixteen and followed them for upward of twenty plus years to look at what's the impact of sexual assault and child sexual abuse. We've learned so much from that that we don't really understand necessarily why there were some of those outcomes, but we know that in fact there were those results. Um, survivors have also taught us what they need. So the development, for example, of the rape crisis or sexual assault movement, recognizing that it's not just um, women and girls who are sexually assaulted, but also men and boys. Um, the full breadth of services, the laws have changed. You know, we know that, for example, survivors were increasing, just unwilling and for very good reason to want to participate in a criminal prosecution if what ended up coming into evidence was their complete sexual history that had no relevance at all to the actual sexual assault that was being prosecuted. And so as a response to that and to the fact that juries are distracted by that non-relevant but maybe what they might view as very negative evidence, we pass rape shield laws that say the presumption is a survivor's sexual history isn't relevant, there are limited circumstances under when it, come, it comes in. Um, those are just some examples, but I think, again, it, survivors are at the heart of this movement. They built this movement, and I think in any work that we're doing, we always want to remember that um, it's really an extraordinary debt of gratitude that we owe them for their courage. One piece of advice that I have for SARTs is don't avoid the hard conversations. I think we all have a tendency in life to want to sidestep conversations that we think or know will be difficult. And in the long run, that's almost always a mistake. And it certainly is in the context of a SART um, that it will always come back around. So those difficult conversations, for example, about the fact that the different folks participating may have in the short term or, long, or medium term have different goals, have different confidentiality or privacy obligations, bring different perspectives in terms of what uh, survivors should be able to determine or decide for themselves. Um, and that just needs to be out on the table. It should be recognized. It doesn't mean that you can't work together. It does mean that you need to respect those differences. One thing that we haven't really talked about so far is the issue of mandatory reporting. And there are very different perspectives around mandatory reporting. And by that, I mean laws that require certain professionals. And in some jurisdictions, it requires everyone in the, in the state um, to report child abuse or elder abuse or abuse of a person with a disability. And even within the movement, there are differing perspectives. It doesn't mean that some are right and that some are wrong, but that everybody brings experiences, concerns. It's not that some are more legitimate than others. Um, I will say from my perspective, I quite understand and respect and appreciate why they're mandatory reporting laws and the ways in which they can help us achieve safer communities. 
but I also think it's absolutely critical for survivors to have somewhere and someone to whom they can turn for support, for advice, for information, and that they have an opportunity to gather that information without it necessarily triggering a report to law enforcement. I think it's absolutely critical that that exists. That's a tension point, and it's not that it's ever going to get resolved within the SART, but acknowledge it and figure out a way to respect it and to continue to work together and also to be mindful of it so that you know, for example, as you are sitting around the table, who's a mandatory reporter and who's not. And not just when you're sitting around the table, but really in all the work that everyone is doing so that if they're making referrals, before they give a referral to a survivor so that that provider knows, I just want you to know that if you seek this service, if you tell them X or Y, they will be obligated legally to report that to Child Protective Services, Adult Protective Services, law enforcement, whomever it is in their jurisdiction. That's at the heart of informed consent. And I think providing referrals, for example, without telling a survivor what might happen when they share information is a real disservice. And it, that, it's a breach of trust, and it's a breach of the responsibility that we've been given. One of the challenges that SARTs confront now and need to address going forward or starting today is who's on that SART. And when I say who's on it, I mean the fact that so often the voices that are at the table, the professionals that are sitting in those conversations Number one, don't reflect the survivor community that they're intended to serve. And number two, that the providers themselves don't reflect the diversity of our communities and of the professions. And that it's easy to say, well, we opened up, we posted our job announcement and we didn't get any diverse applicants. We didn't get anyone from, you know, the Spanish-speaking applicants, or we didn't get anyone speaking Farsi or whatever um, languages it may be that you're looking primarily to serve. And so we just wash our hands and say, oh well, there's nothing more that we can do. That's not how change happens. And change has to happen, and it has to happen and in partnership with people who have the privilege and people who have the power. Because I think if we just leave it to marginalized communities, it's never going to change. And it has to be intentional. It has to be a commitment. And it doesn't happen overnight. You know, that you don't build trust by posting an advertisement on Craigslist or on idealist.org, but you build trust by being there, by reaching out and not saying, this is what we can offer, but rather saying, what do you need? And how can I, as a provider, how can my agency, how can our community better meet those needs? So for example, when you're thinking both about what survivors need, survivors need providers who reflect their life experiences in terms of race, ethnicity, country of origin, language, faith community. So much of our work is built on asking survivors to be brave and courageous. And if we want to take down the barriers that exist, we need to have that commitment, and we need to be proactive. And it takes allies. We can't just leave it to communities that are marginalized, and I will say increasingly becoming marginalized and threatened, but that we have to use our power, our privilege, in a way that advances the rights and the interests and the good for everyone, not just for the few, not just for the dominant culture. And that requires a consciousness, a commitment, a giving up of some of our power and privilege to make space at the table, and it, inquire, it requires intentionality. It doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen by overnight. It happens by acknowledging the circumstances, learning, being humbled, and saying to folks who may not look the same as us on the outside, I want to learn. I want to listen. I know that I have a responsibility 
with all of my power and my privilege to make this a more just world. And we want to do that collectively, not just for a few. When I say don't take it personally, what I mean is that uh, when an advocate, for example, isn't sharing a survivor's personal information, that I want other folks on the SART to know that they shouldn't take the refusal to give information, that it's not personal, like I don't trust you law enforcement or I don't trust you prosecutor or whomever else it may be that they're not sharing that information with. It's not an advocate's decision whether or not information gets shared. It's the survivor's decision. And without that written and informed consent, that advocate can't be disclosing a survivor's personal information. And so it's not that the advocate isn't trust those other folks on the SART, it's that they are prohibited, whether it's ethically, legally, morally, from giving a survivor's information without the survivor's consent. That has to be at the heart of the work that the advocate is doing. It's an amazing privilege to do this work. Um, I can say that I admire each and every survivor that has ever trusted me enough to share their experience. And it's humbling. And I take that responsibility and that trust and feel a thousand percent that it, I have to treasure it, respect it. Um, you know, as I was thinking about this, I real, the quote that came to mind for me was the quote from Hillel that says, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? And if I'm not for others, who am I? And if not now, when? That each one of us has an obligation to make this world a better place and to seek justice and to help one another and the reasons how we come to this work and why we do this work are as varied as survivors themselves and as the population. But in the end, I can think of nothing more honorable and that when I, at the end of my life, know that I'll look back and think, what did I accomplish? That one of the things I'll be most proud of is that I got to um, make a difference in people's lives and in survivors' lives. And that gives life meaning beyond words.